By the end of this course, you'll be able to learn how to become sentimental. I mean, you can learn how to conduct sentiment analysis and use this to improve the probability of your entry. So let's talk about that right now. So today you're going to learn what is sentiment analysis and also why is it so important? Not a lot of people are talking about this, so why even bother? If you don't bother with it, it's gonna be at your own cost because this is what professional traders look at. What are the factors that's gonna affect sentiment? VIX COT report, let's talk about that too, and one leading indicator which helps you predict future recessions, and it is not the stock market, and of course, some forex pairs that can help you indicate what is the market sentiment, okay? Do you know why there are many, many times where your technical indicators and fundamental indicators give you the green light, but then the price moves in the opposite direction? It is because you might have neglected sentiment analysis. So what is sentiment analysis? Basically, how are traders feeling at this point in time? How are they feeling about the future? And this is going to determine the future direction of the market. So first type of emotion is people are feeling good. You know what I'm saying? When times are good, people are happy, optimistic. If you study finance and you flip through the textbook, you come across this term. It is called risk on environment. Okay, it means that people just want to take risks. So imagine if you have a risk-taking switch and you just turn it on. When you turn it on, then okay, it's time to take risks. When you turn it off, then it is chill time. The second type of emotion is people are feeling down, very sad, feeling negative about things. You know, economy is not doing so well. When there's a recession, people, you know, they just want to keep their money. Their main focus is to preserve capital rather than grow their wealth, just like risk on environment, okay? People want to protect what they have. So in finance, it is called risk of environment. Of course, there's another type of emotion is when people are if you study candlesticks, you know uncertainty. People are confused. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. Of course, the easiest, easiest way to analyze sentiment is to look at the candlestick pattern. You see a big, long, bullish candlestick, especially in the middle of the trend. It shows you that people are optimistic, so they push the price up. When you see a big, long candlestick, especially right in the middle of a downtrend, that tells you that people are pessimistic. Uncertainty, there are a lot of patterns that can tell you that, especially a doji pattern. If you still don't know that, why bother with sentiment analysis? Because first thing first, this is a tool that a lot of hedge fund traders, bank traders use. And if you want to ignore it, Feel free to do that. On YouTube, there's a lot of technical analysis videos. Go and watch those all you want. If you are still here, then let's continue talking, okay? Because we want to be different. Second thing is that it moves market not only in the short term, but also in the long term. A lot of people say, Karen, how come I follow fundamentals? I calculate all my financial statement ratios. I look at all the economic indicators, I study those things. But then when the price moves, sometimes it just doesn't make sense because this is what sentiment analysis is. It doesn't make sense. Of course, as a trader, you need to study technical analysis, fundamental analysis, because you know why? These two factors are what drives market when things are normal, you know, when there's no shit going on in this world, just like the freaking stupid virus. Take one example, Fukushima earthquake in 2001. Fundamentals tell you that by right, yen should go down because there's an earthquake in Japan, right? So economy is going to go on a downturn, it's gonna get affected. Surprise, surprise, yen went up instead. Why is that? Doesn't make sense, right? Because of sentiment 
issues. You know, we've got some issues. You can see that if you ignore sentiment analysis, you can get into a lot of stupid trades. You know what I'm saying? So, it is going to override fundamental factors and also your technical factors that's why sometimes people say how come technical fundamentals doesn't work you know and when it comes to sentiment trading you don't rely on this one tool alone to make a trade you use it as a confirmation remember confirmation it doesn't make sense to just look at for example oh there's a doji over here let me just take the other side of the trade and you just open a trade based on that Nothing else. You don't look at fundamentals, you don't look at other time frames, you don't look at other things. Doesn't make sense, right? Same thing for sentiment. Use it as a confirmation. And when it comes to sentiment trading, you can either trade along with the sentiment or against the sentiment. So if you are a beginner, you gotta trade along with the sentiment, okay? But if you want to be different, you know, you can do anything you want. So you gotta understand that what is going to shift the market sentiment, okay? What is going to cause the strong bullish trend to suddenly you turn to a bearish trend, bearish trend suddenly you turn to a bullish trend. It has to be something unexpected. It cannot be predictable like Trump is going to say something smart today. It cannot be as predictable as that. So one of the major things that's going to affect sentiment is the major macro factors. Now, macro factors, there are a lot of things, a lot of and some of the macro factors that is going to affect sentiment are basically things that appear in the news like you see on your Facebook everywhere, it's just everywhere, everybody is talking about it. So you can have things like war, terrorism, geopolitical factors, for example, elections. And by the way, elections give you very, very good sentiment traits. Oil price surge. And of course, things like financial crisis. Don't know when the pandemic is gonna end. You know, people are talking about it, so... Central bank announcements, they have to do something that is totally unpredictable. You know what I'm saying? Like if everybody think that they're going to raise interest rates, but then they suddenly cut, then is it gonna change sentiment? Yes. Central bank actions, not just any action, okay? Second thing is, at which stage of the economic cycle are we in right now? This is going to affect where capital flow to and where capital would flow out of. And something as simple as a tweet from a major influencer in the market that everybody knows about, not an unknown person like me, you know, can be a major news source or a social media account that everybody is talking about. Does this sound familiar to you? Oh, <clears throat> Wall Street. Bad. And I just want to talk about this. If you haven't watched my economics course, I talk about economic cycle, okay? So I'm not going to elaborate into detail, talk the same thing again, because you get bored. But I just want to talk about how capital flow in various different economic cycles. Because as you know that in the economic cycle, there's the expansion phase, the peak phase, then the recession phase, then the trough where recession stops going down. You know what I'm saying? And then it goes back to expansion and then the cycle repeats itself. During this cycle, roller coaster right? you need to understand that capital constantly flow from high risk to low risk market during a recession. During the expansion phase, when times are good, capital is going to flow back to high risk markets. You know what I'm saying? Because investors want to find higher yields, markets with higher yields. So, you know the cycle, expansion, peak, then go back to recession. So, capital is going to flow back to low risk markets. So, you need to understand that this is how Capital flow is, capital is going to constantly flow from high risk markets, high risk currencies during good times to low risk markets, low risk currencies during bad times. And when the recession recovers, it's going to flow back to high risk market, high risk currencies. And then you know the cycle repeats itself again and again. There are some economists who say that, you know, economic cycle is a fraud. Let's not debate today. If you study the past recessions, you realize that 
during a recession, certain currency pairs is going to go up. During good times, certain currency pair is going to go up. It's just like how during bad times, defensive stocks, dividend stocks, consumer staple stocks, utility stocks, healthcare stocks is going to go up. And when times are good, you have things like travel stocks, non-essential stocks, for example like luxury stocks, then the things that you don't really need but want. So the first sentiment indicator, if you're a beginner, it's good to start with this. But if you feel that this is too complicated, the easiest, easiest one is look at S&P 500. If it's going up, then it tells you that people are optimistic. When it's going down, it tells you that people are scared, pessimistic. Basically, it is called volatility index. Okay, let me just write this down. In case some people cannot stand my accent, volatility index ought to be specific, CBOE, volatility index. Some people call it the fear index because it measures how scared people are, okay? The higher it is, then the more fear there is in the market. So when people are scared as shit, then you look at all the risk of assets and buy those. Then sell the risk on assets. You know what I'm saying? When VIX is super super low, below 20, okay? When it's below 20, it tells you that people are complacent. You know what? Things are good. So when VIX is low, fear is very low. Then you look to buy the risk on assets assets then short the heck out of the risk of assets you know what i'm saying now you get the whole gist of things go and back test you realize that in the past recessions all the time even last year in 2020 vix will spike every time there's a crisis recession macro event that causes people to panic so what is the panic mode there's no specific number to it but if it's more than 40 more than 40. In fact, I feel that 40 is a bit too little. More than 80 people are super, super panicking. Because in 2008 and last year, it went all the way above 80. If you combine this with intermarket analysis, which you should, which you should, okay? Don't be like trading the bubble and shit like that. There's an inverse. Okay, my line is not straight. If you overlay the VIX chart with S&P 500 chart, you realize that during recessions, during a crisis, okay, even during small things like, okay, not small thing, but you're doing things like election. Like I said, macro factors, okay, macro factors. Stock market is going to be like, bye-bye, going down, okay, I'm going to head out. One week before elections, during crisis, stock market, going to plunge. And then you see VIX doing this. So a lot of times, you will see that there's almost an inverse correlation between S&P 500 and VIX. So if you trade S&P 500 CFDs, or if you invest in a stock market in a long term index, okay? Add this tool to your plan. Just go back and back test all the past elections, even things like European debt crisis. You'll see the same thing again. So basically, the next thing COT reports. Now, I won't go too detail into this. I will make another video and then go into super super detail. Basically, COT reports, it tells you what the hedge funds are holding right now and also what the companies, commercial participants are holding right now because the COT reports consist of non-commercial and this is why you need to know who are the forex market players, you know what I'm saying? Who are the participants? So non-commercial is what you need to look at because this include hedge funds, institutions who use currencies to speculate. What you don't want to look at is the commercial participants because these type of participants they use futures currency futures to hedge against currency movement for example if you are an international company you have 
businesses overseas. When you convert currencies, you don't want the currency to move against you. So companies use it to hedge. And what is it that you don't need to look at companies who use currency to hedge? Because this group of people, when they are experiencing a loss, they are going to cut loss. Whereas for this type of people, when they are having a loss, they are less likely to cut loss. So basically, just focus on the non-commercial positions. And most importantly, don't look at the absolute numbers. Doesn't mean that, okay, long positions more than short positions means that you should buy. You know what I'm saying? You gotta look at extreme numbers. The key thing is, look at extreme numbers. Put all the positions into an Excel sheet and then look for outliers. You know what I'm saying? Because this is what is going to cause a U-turn in the currency market or the market that you're looking at. It's not about absolute numbers, it's about percentage change, which is also important. And also, are there any extreme numbers, any extreme spikes? So if there are extreme spikes, then you need to take note of it, okay? And also what you're looking at is net long or net short positions. So you take the long positions minus the short positions. If it's positive, then the hedge funds, the institutions, they are net long. So we would look for a potential buy. Then if it's net short, then we would look for a potential sell. But like I said, this is more important, okay? Doesn't mean if it's negative, then you should short. If it's that easy, then... So the downside of COT report is that, of course, you cannot use it to enter a trade alone. You cannot be like, oh, everybody's net long. Based on this, let me just buy. Cannot, okay? Use it as a confirmation indicator. Very important. And also second thing is that the data that's published is a little bit lagging. That is why you cannot use it to enter a trade. But with that said, even though it is lagging, it is not completely useless because a lot of times what the institutions are doing, they are going to move the markets, okay? Speaking of moving markets, market makers, the way they stop you out is just like robbing you legally. It's kind of like that's how the finance people roll, I guess. And also when you go to the website, there are many different options. It's very confusing. You just go for the CME, okay? Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Pick futures only. And then if the long format is too confusing for you, then you choose the short format. If it feels like I'm rushing a bit, it's because later I need to go up. So forgive me. Okay, so what is the leading indicator? that we were talking about just now. You know how stock market is a leading indicator of the economy? Like, like it moves before the economy recovers. And what is a leading indicator for the stock market? There is actually a leading indicator for the stock market and that is bond yields. It leads the stock market and stock market leads the economy okay so it's like the leading indicator of the leading indicator of the what lags behind the economy when your scam broker is trying to withdraw your funds forever and ever and ever. what do you look at specifically you look at the yield curve so if you know how bonds work you have bills short-term bills you have bonds you have notes during normal times long-term rates are going to be higher than short-term rates so Basically, the yield curve plots the difference in rates between short-term and long-term bonds. Short-term bonds over here, long-term bonds over here, medium-term bonds over here, okay? So it goes from like one month, three month, one year, then blah, 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 then 10 years, 30 years, okay? Longer and longer and longer in terms of their maturity, right? So over here, you would have your bond yields in terms of percentage. Okay, so during normal times, like I said, long-term rates higher than short-term rates. So like I said, long-term rates are all on the right side, short-term rates are all on the left side. So guess how the graph is going to be like? Long-term rates higher than short-term rates is going to go like this. Agree with me? Okay, it's a little bit too steep. Too steep, too steep. Maybe like that. Normal, it still looks a bit steep, but... There is a normal yield curve and this one more type of yield curve is the steep yield curve, okay? And when does this happen? When the economy is in a recession and is about to recover, 
back into expansion phase. And there's two other types, flat yield curve, and you also have an inverted yield curve. Okay, basically short term rates are higher than long term rates. This is an indication that a recession is about to come and it has predicted the past 50 years recession. Of course, with anything it's not accurate all the time, but you can use this as an additional confirmation. Why do the curves look like this? I'm not going to explain one by one, but let's just take, for example, a steep yield curve that's going upwards like that. What is the reason that long-term yields go up? Long-term prices are coming down. Why are long-term prices coming down? Long-term bonds, they are subjected to one type of risk, and that is inflation risk. When investors perceive that in the long term, inflation is going to get out of control because the Fed ain't going to do no nothing all day and they are fed up of the Fed. Fed is not going to do anything to control inflation and hence, it's going to erode long-term bond yields. So people don't want those long-term bonds, they're going to sell it off and hence, long-term bond yields are going to go up when they feel that in the future, inflation is going to get out of control. So you realize that the yield curve, the shape of it also depends on central bank actions. And of course, that's for all the details, maybe that's for another video because this is meant to be a crash course. If you don't want to make life complicated, just focus on inverted yield curve because it's a leading indicator that shit is about to happen and prepare to buy some undervalued currencies and stocks. So just now I already talked about high yield, low yield currencies. Maybe let me talk a little bit more about that. You want to take advantage of the fact that carry traders are going to buy currencies with high interest rate differentials. So that's why you're going to pair a high yield currency with a low yield currency. Because if you pair the right type of currency pairs together, for example, let's take Aussie and Yen. One with a relatively higher yield, even though it's quite low. Relatively higher yield currency as compared to a relatively lower yield currency. But even though interest rates have been cut, remember investors' perception is still very important. In the past, this has been a rolling high yield currency, so investors still perceive that, oh, this is a high risk currency, you know what I'm saying? So you pair a so-called high risk currency with a lower risk currency. Some people call this the commodity currency because Australia exports iron ore and also gold. So that's why this currency also moves along with gold prices and also iron ore prices. Higher risk currency and this is perceived as a lower risk currency. Oftentimes you will realize that it will move in the same direction, almost in the same direction. Of course, there's no two markets that are perfectly correlated, but most of the time, it will move in the same direction with high risk markets. Example, S&P 500 or stock market last year, last year, stock market tank, right? At the same time, Aussie Yen also tank. When S&P 500 go back up, Aussie Yen also recovered. So I'm not saying that you should use this as a signal alone to trade. Remember, confirmation, confirmation, conf. If you see that S&P 500 is going up on a very strong uptrend and you're looking to sell Aussie Yen, tell me, is it a good sell? Are you going to wait until Aussie Yen goes back on a strong uptrend? You already know the answer. If you want more advanced stuff, let me know. If you don't all this and you just want technical analysis, it's still okay, it's your life, whatever you like. I'm just saying that this is how professional traders trade. What macro hedge funds look at. I can guarantee you that after I do all these videos telling you what's as important, if not more important than technical analysis, there's still going to be people who is like, Karen, what technical analysis indicator do you use? Oh shit.